Uh, warm welcome to everyone uh, to this week's LID seminar. I'm very pleased to and honored to introduce uh, Professor Davidson Chi Levy. Uh, so I'll just give a very brief um, introduction uh, to his talk, which is on the uh, interplay between online and offline learning. Uh, so David is a professor of engineering systems at MIT and he's the head of the MIT Data Science Lab. Uh, he's done a lot of work across theory and practice, which is really neat, uh, especially in supply chain management and business analytics. He's founded and uh, sold off <laughs> multiple companies in this space and has way too many prizes uh, to be named. And I, like one, uh, I guess, very recent prize is the Inform's Impact Prize um, on uh, uh, identification and mitigation of risks in global supply chains, global supply chains, which we know is a very timely uh, topic of uh, huge importance right now. Um, so with that, I will turn it to David. Oh, and uh, actually one, one more thing. Uh, so in case um, uh, there are questions that come up during the talk that uh, you don't have a chance to have addressed uh, during the seminar, uh, David has a few more minutes at the end uh, for anyone who would like to have a bit more of a conversation with him. So we'll leave the room open for 10, 15 minutes after the talk for anyone interested in that. Now over to you, David. Great. Uh, thank you, Katie. Uh, welcome, everybody. I I'm going to talk about uh, statistical learning and operation, specifically the interplay between uh, online and uh, offline learning. Uh, a good way to start the talk is to describe the infrastructure, the environment at MIT that help us uh, focus on this line of research. At MIT, I lead uh, a data science lab, which is a partnership between MIT and multiple uh, companies um, where we try to focus on the most challenging problems that these companies have by bringing together data models and algorithms and make a significant impact on business performance. Uh, the uh, partnership is cost industry. We have uh, companies in oil and gas, retail, financial services, airline insurance, and uh, the partnership uh, has a global fo footprint. Example of work with industry uh, that we have done in the last couple of years include uh, supply chain segmentation for Dell, um, a lot of work on supply chain resiliency uh, way before uh, uh, the pandemic, starting in 2012 after events like the tsunami in Japan. Our algorithms have been implemented in companies like Ford, Sigma, which is a large food manufacturer in Europe and Latin America, uh, Accenture signed a partnership with MIT uh, around uh, the development um, of technologies that use our analytics for supply chain resiliency. We've done work um, in the area of inventory, transportation, and procurement optimization. Some of our algorithms were implemented by Blue Yonder, which is a large software company in the supply chain space. A lot of work with Home Depot, Accenture, Mango, which is um, a large fashion retailer in uh, uh, Europe, uh, in Spain to be more specific, a work um, uh, in the area of price optimization for uh, online retailers like Rulala. If you buy from Rulala, you pay basically our algorithm. Um, Groupon, Zelando, which is um, an online a retailer in uh, Europe uh, in the fashion space, work uh, with a brick and mortar retailer around optimizing its, their pricing. Uh, Coppel, Coppel is, um, is a large retailer uh, in Mexico. Uh, some of our algorithms were implemented by Oracle. Um, a, a lot of work in the area of resource allocation, in particular online resource allocation in collaboration with Alibaba and IBM, um, work on personalized offering. And this will motivate the research questions that I'll focus on 
uh, our algorithm in this space were implemented by multiple airline carriers. If you fly, for example, from London to Paris, uh, when you buy your airline tickets, we are not involved. But once you decide to buy the airline ticket, our system kicks in and offer ancillary product, uh, priority boarding, car rental, hotel, and the offer that you will get is different than the offer that I will get. The same type of algorithms that we developed were implemented in a variety of insurance uh, companies. And finally, uh, work uh, uh, for AB InBev uh, around uh, integrating online regression uh, together with pandemic modeling. And all this work took us deeper and deeper in the area of statistical learning. Of course, the area of statistical learning is a huge area. And in fact, it's interesting and honor to talk about statistical learning for this group. But if you look uh, at uh, uh, some of the major line of research in statistical learning, they include online learning and offline learning. In uh, online learning, uh, the assumption is the model starts with no data at the beginning of the process. Data is generated on the fly according to some unknown model. Uh, for example, a customer will arrive at a platform. The platform will observe the characteristic of the customer, the feature vector or the context vector, which I will denote by XT based on the context vector or the feature ve vector the platform make a decision the decision may be pricing the decision may be recommending a newspaper article uh, may be recommending a, a video or a book or in healthcare the decision may be recommending a personalized medicine we then observe the reward the reward is assumed to be generated by some unknown model, F star, and the reward depend, of course, on the uh, context and the decision that we make. And I will uh, refer to F star as the ground uh, truth reward function that the decision maker uh, does not know and need to learn. The objective is to design algorithms that will maximize accumulated uh, reward or equivalently achieve low regret. How do we define uh, regret? The regret is defined as a difference between the accumulated reward achieved by a decision maker who knows F star and the accumulated reward achieved by our algorithm that does not know F star and need to learn on the fly. That's the focus in uh, online learning. Offline learning is different. In offline learning, the entire data set, which is assumed to be IID, is available at the beginning of the process. And we cannot use experiment experimentation to generate new data. And so what is the challenge? We have N data samples that are IID. Uh, each data is a triplet, uh, the context, the decision, and the reward. We want to design offline algorithm that will generate a predictive function F hat that somehow will approximate F star. More specifically, we want to design algorithms that with limited amount of data will generate a predictive function F hat such that with high probability, effort will have low error compared with the ground tr uh, truth F star. The only thing that is not well defined here is what do I mean by um, error? Here we will define error as the average square difference between the estimated value and the actual value, what is called mean square uh, error which is specifically or precisely defined by this uh, equation. And so most of the time uh, in the discussion, I will focus on mean square error. Uh, later on, I will uh, extend the result to strictly uh, convex loss function. 
uh, in this process of working with different uh, partners, we realize some important questions on the interface between online and offline learning. The first question is whether or not one can reduce online learning to offline learning. Because if we can do that, then I can use all the tools available uh, for offline learning to solve the online learning problem. And that will be one research line that we will talk about. Uh, the second one is um, around uh, insights that we got from the partner companies that we have collaborated with. They were using our online learning algorithm, but their complaint was that our online learning algorithm ignore all the offline data that they have. And the question is when and how much offline data can help the online learning. So these two line of research are line of research that we have started in the last uh, 12 months. Uh, today, I will start by reviewing uh, um, the first line of research, in particular the paper Bypassing the Monster with uh, Yin Jong Shu. Uh, in this process, I will explain uh, who is the monster and how we can bypass the monster. Depending on time, I will uh, also uh, focus on online learning with offline data, but most of the uh, presentation is around the first line of research. And uh, for the first line of research, here is an outline. I will start uh, with motivation and the key research questions, then explain why technically this is a difficult uh, problem, talk a little bit about what was done in the literature, uh, show you uh, the algorithm, and hopefully convince you that the algorithm is simple uh, and fast, show the main uh, result, the main theory, and provide a roadmap for the proof, and then uh, talk uh, briefly about the recent extension of the Bypassing the Monster uh, paper. And so let me uh, start by defining the problem, the general problem that we are focusing on, the general contextual abandoned model. We are playing capital T rounds. At round little t, a customer arrive. We observe the feature vector of the customer. This feature vector is generated by some fixed but unknown distribution. Based on the feature vector, we make a decision. The decision is one out of k possible different decision, maybe k different product, or perhaps uh, k different prices. And then we observe the reward. The assumption about the reward that we make is that uh, in expectation, given the feature and given the decision, this is basically the ground truth F star. And our objective is to design algorithms that will minimize the, the regret the way I defined it uh, earlier. The only assumption that I will make on F star is that it belongs to some function class big F. The function class big F can be anything, linear, high dimensional linear, RKH, uh, HS, regression tree, neural network, and the like. And our objective is to design an algorithm that will work for every function class big F. Why is this problem is interesting, challenging? Um, there are a couple of reasons. First, this problem combined two aspects. One is statistical learn, I need to learn on the fly. And the other one is decision making under uncertainty. Second, this problem captured two important characteristics of sequential decision making. The first is partial feedback or bended feedback. For each context X, the decision maker observes the reward associated with the decision that the decision maker took, but not reward associated with other decisions. As a result, 
One need to think about uh, the trade-off between exploration and exploitation, exploring different uh, actions and exploiting the one I believe is the best one. So that's one important characteristic in sequential decision. The second one is around heterogeneity. The effectiveness of an action depend on the context, but the context space is huge. And the question is, is there a way to transfer learning from one context to others for general function class? And that's really the key. We are not interested in developing one algorithm for this function class and another algorithm for another one. We want to develop a process that allow us to do this transfer learning um, that works for general uh, function class. Now, the literature, as I'm sure many people in the audience know, on contextual band bandit is huge. And in fact, it cover uh, uh, research in a variety of areas, from CS to statistics to OR, um, um, all the way to economics. You can see here uh, algorithm like uh, UCB, Thompson sampling, uh, Thompson sampling is an interesting uh, development where the original paper was written in the early 1930s, and the focus was on clinical trials, and it sat there for a long time, and uh, he, just in the last uh, 20 years, people started recognizing that this algorithm can be very, very uh, efficient. Exponential weighting, uh, oracle-based algorithm, and the like. And of course, there are lots of papers on applying these types of technology in a variety of applications. Recommendation system, uh, ride sharing, dynamic pricing, healthcare, and the list goes on and on. Just uh, my background is operations. So just to give two uh, uh, operations uh, examples. One is product recommendation. Uh, you have K different product, customer arrive one at a time. When a customer little t arrive, we observe all the characteristic of that customers. Then we decide which product to recommend and we observe uh, uh, the reward. If the product is a newspaper and the reward is a click, we observe click. If the uh, product is a book, for example, that people need to purchase, we observe the purchasing decision. Personalized medicine is another example that people typically refer to. You have K treatment. When uh, uh, a patient arrives, you observe the characteristic of uh, the patient. Then you uh, decide on the personalized treatment and you observe the efficacy of uh, this uh, treatment. And of course, you want to design an algorithm that quickly learn. So what is the, the, the challenge in this class of problems that uh, uh, I described? And as I said, our objective is to focus on the general function class F. Uh, this implies that we are assuming that the ground truth <clears throat> belong to the class big F. And there are in fact two important challenges. The first one is a statistical challenge. We want to design an algorithm that will always achieve the optimal regret for any function class, right? That by itself is a tall order. The second, we want to make sure that this algorithm can be executed efficiently. In fact, if you look at the literature, most of the algorithms that exist can be classified into two categories. Either they are statistically efficient or computationally efficient, but not both. For example, if you think about UCB and Thomson sampling, they are computationally efficient, but they can uh, identify optimal regret under special uh, function class, parametric, for example. Think about exponential weighting or elimination-based method. Uh, these are algorithms that guarantee to find the optimal regret, but they are computationally inefficient. And so what is the research question? Let's start with an observation. Given a general function class big F, the statistical and computational aspect of online uh, regression is well understood. That is to, to say, given IID offline data, we know how to find a predictor F hat, 
remember my definition of our objective in offline data, we know how to find a predictor f hat such that f hat achieve low estimation error and it can be efficiently computed. That we know there are many tools available to execute that, depending on the class uh, big F that we are focusing on. The natural question therefore to ask is, can we reduce the online problem, the general contextual abandoned problem to the general offline regression? Because if I can do that, I can use the available toolkit for um, general offline regression to solve the online problem. More specifically, here is the, the problem. Given a, a function a class F and an offline regression oracle, it may be least square, right? Defined here, or it may be a, a variation of least square like Ridge and Lasso, or perhaps other offline regression uh, oracle. The challenge is to design an algorithm for the contextual bandit that will achieve the optimal regret whenever the offline regression or, or call attain the optimal estimation error, the minimum estimation error. And the algorithm requires no more than just calling the offline regression or call. For a long time, and uh, as we were interested in this problem, we talked to different people of four, um, in this space, for a long time, people were under the assumption that in fact, this is not possible in general. And if you look at the literature, uh, this problem was mentioned as an important open problem in a variety of, uh, of uh, papers. So uh, why is this challenging problem? What are the technical challenges that you face when you are thinking about reducing an online uh, contextual bandit to the corresponding offline problem. In fact, there are a number of challenges. I'm going to focus on uh, specifically two. These two are statistical challenges. One is associated with uh, confidence bound, and the second one is associated with analyzing dependent action. Let me explain each one of them. The first one is associated with uh, confidence bound. If you think about uh, algorithm like UCB or Thomson sampling, they work by constructing effective confidence uh, bound that works in general, basically for every pair of context and uh, decision, and they shrink. And this allow us to generate effective solution, uh, but this work uh, only for simple uh, uh, function class A, for example, uh, linear. And we know from statistics that it's impossible to do the same thing, uh, um, design effective confidence bound for general function class uh, F. And in fact, um, uh, Foster and his quarter in 2018 uh, propose a computationally efficient uh, algorithm that is focused on uh, confidence bound. Uh, by applying offline regression or call, what we are trying to, uh, to achieve. The problem based on what I just described is that this uh, provides statistical guarantee only in special cases. You need very strong assumption to get uh, 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 optimal regret. The second challenge is associated with analyzing dependent uh, action. And here is a problem. The assumption in the, the, the offline learning model is a data IID, but the data in the online learning process is nothing but IID. The distribution of action today depends on all the data that I've collected up to uh, today. And so it's hard to make the connection between the two to overcome this difficulty, uh, Dylan Foster, and Sasha Rackling from here, from MIT, develop, uh, in fact, an optimal and efficient algorithm for the contextual bandit uh, by assuming access to online regression oracles. The beauty of their work is that uh, when you focus on online regression oracle, online regression uh, oracle provide statistical guarantee that holds for arbitrary segments of data. 
And so the IID challenge does not exist. The problem is that efficient algorithm for the associated online regression oracle only exists for specific function class. We don't have efficient algorithm for a variety of important function classes like neural network, uh, holder classes, and, and the like. And so here is our contribution. We provide uh, the first optimal and efficient black box reduction from the general contextual bedded to um, online uh, regression. So uh, the, the result is, as you will see in a second, very general. The algorithm is quite simple, and the contribution is not the algorithm. Also, uh, we are very proud of the algorithm. I would say it's an evolution based on what was done in the literature. And in fact, um, we, are, we build on uh, uh, important result in the literature. Agrawell paper from 2014, Aben Long that focus on linear bended and the recent paper that I mentioned by Fester and Rafi. But what we did, which is a critical contribution, we were able to connect the different line of research. And let me explain. Agrawell works on this problem in the policy space, not in the function space. Whereas Aben Long and Foster and Ratlin work uh, and, and think about the problem in the function space, like us. Reading these papers, we were able to identify a hidden connection between these two lines of research. As a result, we were able to modify some of the existing algorithm, but the analysis is completely different than the analysis in the paper that I mentioned. It's really this insight that allow us to connect Agrawell, and I'll talk about this insight in a few minutes, connect Agrawell paper to uh, Abel Log and Foster and Racklin that suggest uh, we can design an algorithm that achieves the two objectives that I mentioned. But the bottom line is any advance in offline regression our result says immediately translate to the contextual benefit on both aspects, first statistically and second computationally. To uh, uh, put our contribution in perspective, let's uh, introduce some of the algorithms that exist uh, in the literature. The first that I'm focusing on is uh, regressor elimination. Regressor elimination from Agrawell in 2012 guaranteed to find the optimal uh, regret, but it's intractable. It does not satisfy our second requirement. Uh, 2014, I'll talk about that uh, paper in a few minutes again. Um, Agrawell came with another algorithm that guaranteed to find the optimal regret for general function class by making that many calls to an offline classification oracle. That's great. The problem with offline classification oracle, you need to solve NP hard problems. And in fact, you need to solve many NP hard problems. Reg CB make polynomial uh, number of calls to an offline regression oracle. This is in fact what we want to do, but it's optimal under strong assumption. It's suboptimal in general. Square CB, that's the algorithm from uh, Foster and Racklin that we are building on and that I described uh, earlier, guarantee to find the optimal regret by making that number of call to an online regression oracle. The problem is that efficient algorithm for the corresponding online regression oracle exists only for special classes. David, uh, quick question. Yeah. Could you comment on why reg CB is more desirable than uh, Agrawal 2014 on so, computational complexity? Reg, reg CB is, uh, in practice, it's one of the most, uh, empirically, it's one of the most effective algorithm. Um, if you compare ag to Agrawal, uh, 2014, here I need the number of uh, calls is uh, not large, but I need to solve NPR problems. Every call requires solving an NPR problem, whereas here I just execute uh, an ah. offline regression. Ah, okay, thank you. 
And uh, but I, I, I want to mention another uh, characteristic of RexCB. RexCB empirically, it's one of the most powerful uh, algorithms that exist, although it has a limitation that I just mentioned. Falcon, which is our algorithm, I'll talk about where the name is coming from, guarantee to find the optimal uh, regret by making log T calls to an offline regression when T is unknown at the beginning of the process. And if T is known in the beginning of the process, we can reduce the number of calls to log log T, right? That's really what we will uh, focus on. Now, uh, one question that people ask when I give this talk is, where does the name uh, monster come from? And what does monster refer to? In the contextual bandit, monster refer to algorithms that require a huge amount of computation. And the first authors to uh, refer to their paper as the monster paper is Dudik and his uh, co-author. In this paper, they design an algorithm that guarantee to find the optimal regret. But as they say, it requires monster amount of computation. And therefore, they call their paper the monster paper. The other 2014 paper, as I mentioned, uh, guaranteed to find the optimal regret by making call to offline classification oracle. Problem, of course, is that you need to solve NPR problem. That's why they call it tamming the, the monster. We refer to our paper as bypassing the monster because the realizability assumption allow us to overcome the problems uh, in all these papers. So what is the algorithm? And as I mentioned, uh, uh, while we are excited about the algorithm, the algorithm is really not the main contribution. You will see there are some unique characteristics of the algorithm. The main contribution is the ability to connect different line of research that allow us to prove that indeed the algorithm achieve the two objectives that I uh, mentioned. And so uh, what is the algorithm? The algorithm has three components, an epoch schedule that will divide the interval into sub-intervals of increasing lengths, a greedy call to the offline regression oracle at the beginning of every sub-interval, or what I call an epoch, to uh, obtain, to generate a predictor for that sub-interval, and then a randomized algorithm or a sampling uh, rule that we will use in each one of the epoch or each one of the sub-interval. The sampling rule was initially introduced by this beautiful paper by Aben Long, who focused on uh, the linear bandit. And then this old paper received new life uh, in the paper by Foster and Racklin, and we are doing, going to build based on this idea. Uh, our uh, algorithm is called Falcon for fast least square regression or call for contextual bended, and we use Falcon for obvious uh, reason. So let me describe each one of the components in our uh, algorithm. The first is an epoch schedule. We generate uh, a schedule that allows us to subdivide the interval the time horizon into some interval. If T is unknown, we use a geometric sequence. As a result, we'll have log T sub intervals. If T is known, we can use double exponential uh, sequence and therefore the number of sub intervals is log log of T. The key observation is that as we move along the time horizon from uh, left to right, the length of each sub interval is increasing. Since we are going to call the offline regression oracle only once at the beginning of every epoch or a beginning of every interval. It implies that the oracle is called less and less frequently as we proceed with the algorithm. The second component of the algorithm is uh, 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 making one call to the uh, offline regression oracle to obtain a predictor. If the oracle, the offline regression oracle is a least square, we call the least square. Otherwise, we call uh, whatever uh, we think is, is appropriate, for example, Ridge uh, or Lasso. 
Now that we have a predictor, the question is what to do. That's really the challenge. And if we uh, use a predictor in a greedy way, meaning we use a predictor to tell us what is the best action for a, a specific context, it's not going to be uh, effective because there is no learning that we are performing because maybe F hat, our predictor is not the ground truth. That's where we are going to use exploration, exploitation trade, trade off through the sampling algorithm. So what is the sampling? Uh, algorithm or the randomized algorithm, we will define uh, like, remember, Aben Long and uh, uh, Foster and Racklin, a, a learning rate. Our learning rate is a little bit different than le their learning rate, but the idea of a learning rate uh, was introduced in Pasper. Notice that in our learning rate, as we move from uh, sub-interval to sub-interval, from epoch to epoch, their learning rate increases. We will see in a second the role of the learning rate. So we are at the beginning of round uh, T and uh, we observe a context XT. Uh, since I'm focusing on epoch M, I have the predictor F hat of M, right? If we decide to use the, the, the uh, predictor in a greedy way, then the greedy action is A hat. Right, but we are not going to do that, right? We are going to uh, choose an action A, not the greedy action with probability inversely proportional to the gap between the value of our predictor at the greedy action and the value of the predictor at action A. The, the, the bigger the gap, the smaller the probability. This selection of an action, which is not the greedy action, correspond to exploration. And with the remaining probability, we are going to select the greedy action, which correspond, which refers to the exploitation uh, stage. Notice that the learning rate controls the trade-off between exploration and exploitation. Because uh, the learning rate increases as we move from epoch to epoch, you can see that we use uh, less and less frequently the non-greedy action. As we learn more, we reduce the likelihood that we use the non-greedy action and we increase the likelihood that we use the, the best action associated with our predictor because we learn more and more. That's basically the entire, the entire uh, algorithm. In a few minutes, I'll also talk about specifically what's the difference between our algorithm and the, the algorithm uh, by uh, others like uh, Avon Long and uh, Foster and Rackling. But notice one important thing in our algorithm. I am making updates only at the beginning of an epoch, which means that I don't need to know the rewards immediately when I give, make the decision. I can give a decision now and wait until the end of the epoch. At that time, I need, I need to observe the reward in order to generate the next uh, predictor using the offline regression. So uh, what can we say about the simple uh, algorithm? Let me start with a special case of our result by uh, focusing on finite function uh, class. We show that Falcon guarantee an expected regret no more than a constant times square root of K, the number of action times T times log of F using log T calls if T is unknown at the beginning of the horizon. We can reduce, as I mentioned, uh, the number of calls to log log of T if T is known. The beauty of this result is that this is done by calling least square regression. And we know from the literature that there is a matching lower bound, which means that in this case, our algorithm is optimal. So this is a special case, a finite fl a function class case. Let's focus on the general case. So in the general case, we need to uh, start by identifying what is the input. So here is my uh, uh, input. Given NIID uh, samples, 
and an offline regression oracle they return a predictor such that the mean square error is bounded by ER. So think about ER as the estimation error guarantee. And of course, the estimation error depends on N, the number of data points that we have in the offline uh, 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 space, and the complexity of the function F. We show that given uh, such an offline regression oracle with an estimation error ER, Falcon guarantee an expected regret no more than a constant times square root of K ER times T. And as I mentioned before, uh, this uh, can be done uh, by making log T call to the offline regression oracle, or we can reduce it to log log T. The beauty of this upper bound is that there is a matching lower bound in a sense that if ER is rate optimal, this is the minimum possible mean square error, then we know that the same value is a lower bound, which means that our algorithm finds the optimal regret. And so before I talk about uh, the proof, uh, let's apply the result to a variety of uh, function classes to see what kind of regret uh, we get uh, in this analysis. And so the first example that I want to focus on is just a simple example where the class F is linear with dimension uh, D. We know um, that least square uh, guarantee an error proportional to D over N. As a result, um, our uh, algorithm achieve a regret proportion uh, no more than square root of KT D plus log D, which improve on what is known as a f in the literature as a function of t. If f is linear with dimension d and sparsity s, we know that uh, under certain condition on the distribution of uh, the context vector, lasso ensure an error uh, proportional to s log d divided by n. Falcon therefore achieve a regret of square uh, root of KS T log of T. We can apply to neural network. In fact, uh, for neural network, uh, there are a couple of results on mean square error. One of the result uh, as a function of N is one over square root of N. This translate to our uh, space um, uh, as a regret uh, equal to T to the power of three over four we can apply the result to a generalized linear model uh, and so forth and so on. The point is this works in general. The key question is how do you prove such a result? And, and remember uh, really the challenge that I, the two challenges that I, I identified. One is in offline the, the learning the data assume IID, but our data is not. And the second is that offline uh, guarantee is an upper bound on the distance, right? Mean square error between the predictor and the ground truth, assuming a thick action distribution. Our action distribution is nothing by thick. It's generated by the sampling rule, by the randomized algorithm. And the more data we have, the more we change our, uh, the distribution of the action. So our starting point is to move away from the uh, function class, uh, from the function space, and to transfer the problem into the policy space. Remember, we are going to connect two lines of research. One is the line of research that works on the function space. One is on the policy space. We are taking this problem defined on the function space and, and, and reducing it. Uh, translating in, into the policy space. In the policy space, there is a mapping, basically. A policy is a mapping between uh, a context and a decision. And I will refer to the true optimal policy by using pi f star. And pi f uh, hat m, right, f hat is our predictor, uh, pi f hat is the greedy policy associated with the current uh, predictor. Notice that the sampling rule, the randomized algorithm, generates a distribution over the policy. What is this distribution? This distribution is the probability 
that the sampling rule will select action pi x given a context x. This distribution is a distribution that I'm going to use when I'm uh, analyzing uh, the performance of our algorithm. So the proof has three steps. The first is forget about the ground truth. And let's assume for a second that the predictor f at m that we generated at the beginning of epoch m is, is the ground truth. It may not, but let's assume for a second that it's true. And the result, I can calculate a regret associated with our predictor. You can see that the first component is just the reward associated with a predictor when I choose the greedy policy. And the second component is the reward associated with our predictor when we choose policy pi x generated by our sampling rule. So the grid is just the estimated per round expected regret of policy pi multiplied by the distribution QM, which shows that this cannot be too loud. It's uh, bounded by K, which is uh, the number of action divided by the learning rate. The second step is uh, uh, more involved. Here we are connecting in the second step, the ground truth to the predictor. And the proof is by induction. And in my opinion, this is the heart of the paper. This is the most beautiful uh, part of the contribution of the, of the paper. We show that based on all the decisions that we have made in epoch one all the way to M minus one, then in epoch M for every policy, doesn't have to be the one generated by our sampling rule. The following is true. The true per round expected regret of pi, what is this? This is the reward associated with the ground truth when we select the optimal policy. The second part is the reward associated with the ground truth when we select some policy pi. This expected regret is bounded uh, from above by two times the estimated per round expected regret plus some error. If we combine step one and step two, we can see that the expected regret associated with the ground truth from step two is bounded by the expected regret associated with the predictor plus some error. And from step one, we know that this is bounded by uh, um, a function proportional to the number of action divided by the learning rate. Now we only need to select gamma M very carefully so that uh, we bound the accumulated regret and that gave us uh, the, the, the proof. I, I want to highlight uh, in my opinion, and I think in opinion of some other people that I talked to about the paper, uh, is that really step one is the contribution, and it's the contribution really beyond this paper. Uh, step two, this step two that I'm focusing on, uh, is a proof by induction that connect the regret associated with the ground truth to the regret associated with the predictor for, for, as you can see, any policy. And you notice something important, this holds independent of the decision process, right? In fact, the expectation is on the context. So the only thing I'm emphasizing here is the IID property of uh, X of the context vector, and it uh, uh, allow us to establish a bridge between uh, the online learning and the offline learning uh, models. And so let me uh, make just a, a few observations. The first observation is that I focused um, on statistical guarantee by assuming mean square uh, error loss function. 
MSE loss function, but the result hold for general uh, strongly convex loss function. And this is important, for example, when you focus on generalized linear models. In this case, uh, some people don't use MSE. The result holds in this case as well. The second observation is thinking carefully about the difference um, uh, between Falcon, our algorithm, and Square CB that was developed by Foster and Racting at the beginning of uh, last, uh, last year. The most important advantage of uh, Square CB is that it does not require IID assumption. It holds for general context whereas Falcon requires the IID assumption, like uh, the assumptions that are used for offline learning. That's clearly a big advantage of Square CB. The big disadvantage of Square CB is that it relies on efficient algorithm for online regression, but this is known only for specific function uh, classes. Uh, the case of Falcon, there are many, many function classes that are covered by computationally efficient offline regression. And the last uh, element to highlight is that um, Square CB requires, uh, like Eben Long as well, continuous updates, whereas uh, Falcon um, updates only at the beginning of an epoch. So these are occasional updates. This seems to be way more appropriate for healthcare uh, applications where the reward is not transparent immediately. You need to wait until you can observe uh, the reward. Let me summarize uh, this part. And in fact, it's going to be the only part by uh, focusing on a few extension that either uh, we did uh, or other people did based on uh, the work uh, that I just described. Remember at MIT, you have two groups working on similar problems. Uh, one is uh, Dylan Foster and Sasha Racklin that develop uh, the, the reduction to online regression. And then Yin John and myself focusing on the reduction to uh, offline regression. We teamed up. Uh, and we uh, focused on extending results from min-max regret. The work that Sasha and Dylan did is about min-max regret. The work that we did is around min-max regret. Think about this, identify a policy that uh, will minimize the worst uh, possible regret. But there is a lot of uh, uh, work in uh, multi embedded in contextual embedded on instant dependent guarantees. And so we um, extended in this joint paper the, the work to instant dependent uh, guarantee first for contextual embedded. Um, the algorithm that is introduced in this joint paper is called adaptive CB for adaptive contextual uh, bandit. It follows the same idea and the same template that I described uh, to you uh, uh, earlier with two important uh, differences. One is we use confidence bound to eliminate uh, inefficient action. And the other one in our paper, the learning rate is designed to achieve the specific bound here uh, the learning rate is data uh, driven. Second, this paper extends the result to reinforcement learning, but not to the general reinforcement learning. First, contextual embedded is not reinforcement learning because when you make the decision, you don't affect the next context that will arrive. In reinforcement learning, the decision makes this. So the, the, we cannot, at least, Right now, we don't have results for the general reinforcement learning, but the result ex exists for a special case uh, called uh, block MDP. When you make a decision, you affect to which block the next context belong to. Uh, within the block, it behave according to some general, some distribution, it's IID, but you don't know which block it will, the blocks are hidden to us. So if there was one block, it's reduced to contextual bended. In general, um, uh, this is more difficult, but it's not the general reinforcement level. Let me just mention before highlighting some other extension. 
the two papers, the one uh, with Yin John bypassing the monster and the one uh, where the two teams work together uh, are both uh, available on uh, archive. What's exciting also is that people from other institutes recognize the, the depth and the importance of the result in bypassing the, mon the monster. And uh, already uh, multiple papers uh, have been posted on um, archive. Let me just describe some that uh, at least we are familiar with. Uh, Asaf Zvi and his PhD student from Columbia University extended the result uh, to contextual bended with infinite set of action. Uh, people from uh, um, Stanford extended the result to a setting where F is misspecified. Uh, people from USC extended the result to non-stationary contextual bended and a team that include people from a variety of uh, institutes extended the result to combinatorial uh, action uh, space. And uh, so uh, this reflects the importance and the depth of the result affecting beyond just the general contextual bandage that I uh, just uh, described. I was uh, hoping and planning to talk about online learning with offline data, but we are hitting the, the hour. So I will pause here and see if there are comments uh, or uh, questions. Hello, Ali. Hi. So, um... Thank you so much for uh, uh, a wonderful talk. Um, I was wondering if uh, <clears throat> you can sort of comment on the possibility of using this for um, con uh, for partial monitoring, uh, which is a setting where you don't get a full banded feedback, you get um, a coarser feedback. Uh, for example, if I, you know, if I want to show you website designs, um, you know, the feedback may be that people liked the design or not, uh, but it could be because they liked the color, because they liked the format, or because they liked the, the structure. So it's basically the case where if you think of bandit problems as, you know, um, a matrix problem where the feedback is the entry in the matrix, a bunch of entries have the same value. So the feedback is much more coarse or quantized. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, sure. Um, you, you know, of course, that uh, we are focusing on partial feedback in our problem, but you describe it, you're describing something a little bit more involved and I'm not, I'm not 100% sure. Okay. I, I mean, it would be really interesting if we can use it. I'll read the paper more carefully to see if there's an opportunity there. I think that, that would be will be, that will be beautiful. Also, if you can send us a, any reference that describes a problem specifically that you are referring to, it will allow just to understand. I'm a little bit uh, uh, vague about the specific of how to formulate the problem. So that, that will be a good starting point for me. Uh, and, and maybe if you can read, uh, you can find out. Okay. okay. All right, so this marks the end of the official session. Uh, so let's all give a huge round of applause for uh, David's seminar. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, for anyone who does have some questions, uh, we'll have a few more minutes after this official session uh, to chat with David. And I, and I should recommend if anybody is interested in this line of research, I mentioned a few papers. Also look at um, um, the second line of research that I'm focusing on here online learning with offline data because it uh, suggests some, in my opinion, beautiful insight 
that you don't see when you look either at offline or in uh, the online space. So I, I do have a question from earlier. I was wondering if you could give us some intuition as to uh, what the your work as well as um, I think Dylan and Sasha's work, what allows you to avoid using the um, classification oracle and use the regression oracle instead? So very good. In fact, the main contribution is to connect the algorithm by Agarwell that is using the uh, classification oracle, as you pointed out, to the algorithm of uh, Sasha and Dylan that is using the, uh, uh, just they are using online, we are using offline. And it is step two, remember, of the proof? This is the step that made the connection. And this is the, uh, in my opinion, the main contribution of the paper. And, and this step, um, I know that other people now in the papers that I mentioned have started applying in other environments because it's very surprising what we are doing. We are connecting the, the, the ground truth, right? The expected regret of the ground rules with the expected regret associated with the, the predictor in a non-trivial way. In a sense, we are saying because of all the decision people have made up to until now, uh, uh, there is this beautiful, uh, beautiful connection. And this connection between the different lines of research allow us to understand uh, how we can transfer the ideas in Agrawell to the uh, function uh, space. So I have another question, but I want to pause in case anyone else has questions. I should also again mention if anybody is interested in more insight, you should send email to my student Yin Jun Chu or myself. Um, we have uh, additional materials that we may be able to share with you. Okay. Everyone's being shy, so I'll ask my last question. Um, so, uh, so you mentioned that one of the keys to the Falcon is this requirement of IID. Yes. And so does that preclude uh, reduction of RL to offline learning, would you say? Or what are your thoughts? Uh, so, so remember, in um, the general uh, reinforcement learning, we don't know, and this may be a channel. That's why we need this special case. And the block MDP provided a virtual environment to satisfy the IIT. It's not exactly oh, could, IIT. Could you say more about that? So uh, the, the block MDP basically, uh, this is this slide, right? The block mm -hmm. MDP uh, basically uh, says the following. The interval is uh, T, is subdivided into um, episode. Each episode has, um, for the sake of simplicity, a number of timestamps, let's say H timestamps. I am in a specific episode and I'm making a decision, right? It uh, will affect the context, but the way it affects the context is as follows. When I make the decision, the state of the system is moving to a block. Within this block, everything works as before, but I don't know which block it goes to. And so under this, uh, assumptions that was introduced uh, uh, before in the context of reinforcement learning, we can uh, have uh, the type of results that I described. But if you don't have that and you're asking about the general, exactly because of the reason that you described, uh, right now, we don't know how to do it. Okay, thank you very much. All right, thank you. 
All right, so I think we'll end it there then. Thank you, everybody. All right, bye everyone. And thanks, Katie, for uh, inviting me. Yes, thank you for giving us honor. <laughs>